Okay, once again, thank you for joining and coming to the third annual Seven Last Words service, St. Paul's Missionary Baptist Church. We're, we're here at 160 Kingsley Avenue. It's uh, March 29th at 7 p.m. And my name is Sylvia Black, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to speak on the first word, just get started. It talks about, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I had, uh, God bless me the ability to write a book. It's, you know, a lot of this is scripture in here. <laughs> it's called, Vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will repay. And it specifically deals with forgiveness. And I'm going to talk on that subject of, uh, is there redemption after retribution? Okay, can you be redeemed after you done hurt somebody? Now, let me just find it right quick. Talks about um, being redeemed. Can you be redeemed after you exerted your vengeance, which you felt was just cause on someone? Or maybe you might be the one that was persecuted and you got your persecutor back for what you felt was just, you know, just cause. And you want to know, can you be forgiven? Okay, I'm going to try to just talk basically from, from what I remember. I don't think I can find it. I'm rushing a little for it real quick. Okay, so we're going to talk about it from the subject of is there redemption after retribution? The first word that Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross. Now, he said nobody asked him to uh, forgive them. He just decided to do it. He said, Lord, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Okay. Okay, I found somebody here. And, um, yeah, is there redemption after retribution? Okay, I'm going to turn on one, two. All right. Now, Jesus was uh, persecuted. He was spit on. He was mocked, ridiculed, talked down to. And then after all of that, he was falsely accused. And then he was hung on the cross. Okay, for sins he didn't commit. Okay, now there's a couple of people in the Bible who thought they didn't deserve to be forgiven, and then there's a couple of people who did think they deserved to be forgiven. Um, whether if the Bible says that we are supposed to forgive our enemies regardless of whether they ask us to forgive them or not. Because first of all, if you don't forgive your enemy, then God's not going to forgive you. And how we start out by forgiving, we say, just like Jesus said when he was on the cross, Although we shouldn't wait till we get nailed to the cross to say it, <laughs> is forgive them, Lord, for they don't know what they do. Okay, that's the first step that we take. And then God steps in. I won't say he takes care of the rest, but he definitely steps in uh, where he needs to be. Now there's grace and mercy are homeboys. They grew up together. You know, they always gonna be together. Grace and mercy. Uh, grace and mercy, grace is the ability to handle the thorn that the enemy puts in your flesh. Okay, mercy is undeserved forgiveness that, that he gives us to, be, to forgive us for the thorn that we put in our enemy's flesh. Okay, and we might say to the Lord, uh, oh, this pain is too, too much for me. And God says, my grace is sufficient for me. Okay, there's a reason why we have to go through the mess and the stuff and the junk. Because Jesus Christ himself went through the mess and the stuff and the junk. He knew no sin, and yet he was crucified on the cross. All manner of evil had been committed again, and then he was left there to die. Even after he was on the cross, they still continued to mock him and say, If you be the Son of God, come down from that cross. And I can only imagine that Jesus was saying, I don't have to prove nothing to nobody. I'm doing this for a reason. For people like you and you that are out there sinning. Because once I be resurrected, is what I'm saying, I imagine Jesus is saying, that perhaps now you have a chance at redemption. So the sin that you're committing against me now by hanging me on the cross unjustly, accusing me unjustly, now 
I will allow, allow you to come to me and ask for forgiveness, even after what you've done. But see, they didn't realize that it was a prerequisite that Jesus died on the cross. See, Judas was the one that betrayed Jesus that caused him to get uh, hung on the cross. Okay, and Judas was so guilty about it, which I believe is God's vengeance. That's why I talk about vengeance as my said the Lord. Because even though we say forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do, God is not going to let them get away with what they've done and what they're doing to, against him and against his children. Okay? It may look like they're winning, like they're getting away with stuff, you know, but they're going to they're gonna suffer. That's what it's all about. You know, it says, that's what today is, uh, uh, you know, Good Friday. It's all about mankind will suffer. That's what you got to suffer. It's a prerequisite. Either you're going to suffer and die and go to hell, or you're going to suffer for a little while here on earth and go to heaven and be with the Lord for all eternity. But just like Jesus said earlier, we must say, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Each time they do offend us, even before we leave the house, I believe we should say it. I try to practice it on a regular basis. Forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Because sometimes I forget. And God has to remind me and say, you know, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. And then I, what happens is when you're saying, when you're asking the Lord to forgive them, you're not saying it so that they can get away with the crime that they committed. You're saying it so that you can be, now you're free. You know, it's not our, it's not our battle. This book talks about war, about war. That's just a war, little fighting. Once you decide to serve Jesus, you automatically enlisted yourself in the war. <laughs> it's a battle. You want a battlefield for the Lord? Okay, it's, it's a war because you're going to have to fight against not only spiritual darkness, of evil in the heavenly realms, but we're also going to be fighting you uh, physical people. But the main forces are in the heavenlies where you can't see it, where they come at you from behind, where they sneak up on you. Amen. You know, and the same devices that they use against you and me is the same devices they're going to get caught up in their own trap. You see, you can only be victorious when you serve the Lord and when you be obedient to His word. Saying, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do, that's being obedient to God's word. So we must do it if we want to follow Jesus. We can't, a child can't go around being disobedient to their parent and expect to get things from them. When God says, you for you will uh, be obedient to my word, and I will bless you for doing what I tell you to do, for following after me. Ask me what you will, and it's yours. And so the Bible goes down. Judas was one of the characters who didn't believe he deserved to be forgiven. He had him hanging himself. That's God's vengeance. His guilt got the best of him. And he took his own life. Okay? Uh, take uh, Jezebel. I love talking about Jezebel. <laughs> she, was a, she was a daughter of a king and she was married to a king. Okay? But her being in such, you know, and when they heard their marriage formed an economic alliance. In other words, they owned everything practically. They owned everything. And it was one thing that they didn't know, and that was Nabal's vineyard. And Ahab, which was Jezebel's husband, wanted it. And he felt that because he was king, that he should have it. Nabal said, no, I'm not giving it to you. So he told Jezebel, Jezebel had him killed. And when Nabal went to claim the vineyard, God sent, sent a word. He said, isn't it bad enough that you kill a man that you're going to take his vineyard to? He said, for that, I am going to exert my vengeance on you. Okay? So what, how did Ahab receive uh, forgiveness? He repented. Um, they had a way of repenting back then. I think that was before Jesus was died on the cross. That the priest had to go before him. And for atonement. Rosh Hashanah and, and that other religion, they still practice that. But it's not necessary now. So we can go for ourselves. We can go to the throne on our own. And so... Uh, Judas was one, he betrayed Jesus, and he hung himself, and then Jezebel, now here Jezebel, she, she got it going on, you know, she can do what she want to do, but one thing that God abhorred, he hated her worshiping idolatry. They had a whole temple, a whole church, a whole a big old places of worship where they would actually just go in there and worship silver and gold gods. And see, we, people today, they still worship God, but they don't worship it in that matter. They worship money. They worship people. You know, like you get a job, and you, like you need that job because you got five kids to feed, and the boss asks you to do something which you know is a sin. So what you, are you going to do? Are you going to sin to eat the job, or are you going to say, no, boss, I'm not going to do that, and trust in the Lord? 
you know, first one have to say, forgive them, Lord, but they know not what they do because that's an offense. By them causing you to force you to want to sin. God commands us not to sin, and this man is trying to tell you to sin. So if you if you follow in his footsteps, now you're worshiping idolatry, and that's what Jezebel did. And God exerted his vengeance on her when he had her thrown out the window. It threw out the window so ferociously. It's in the Bible. And that's when I put a lot of the wars in there. You'd be surprised at how many wars were going on in the Bible days. Uh, they threw out the window so ferociously that her blood spattered up against the buildings. She was dead instantly. Okay? The dogs had ate the flesh of her body and licked the blood of her bones. There was nothing left but her hands, her skull, and her feet. Even dogs didn't want it. Can I get some help over here? <laughs> okay, that's God's vengeance being imposed. Okay, just like there was a story about the Philistines in here, they always started trouble. They always made trouble. When David first became king, they, uh, you know, challenged them. You know, come on, let's fight. You know, so David said, okay. But what was David's secret to winning every battle as he traveled through the wilderness on his way to the promised land? Okay, he consulted God first. He said, Lord, what should I do? And then he waited for God to answer, and when God answered, then he followed what God said to do. So you got to follow all the way through, from asking to listening and obeying. And that's also in the Bible. Jesus said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. Jezebel wasn't thinking about forgiving nobody, because she was queen, and she, you know, she had it going on. She was royalty in marriage and in birth. You know, but that royalty didn't stop her from getting thrown out that window. Okay? So no matter how much you got, if somebody wants you, they're going to come and get you. But the only way you're going to be protected is to be in the Lord, to be obedient to God. So you can't get that kind of vengeance, uh, uh, the, the victory, unless you are uh, following the Lord. Okay, we're not going to be victorious with, with swords or knives or guns or harsh words or harsh actions. Not really victorious, maybe for the moment, but later on you turn your back and that's it. So, you know, we more victorious in the word of God, following after him because he works in the spiritual realms to protect us. He can all of a sudden make somebody change their mind. There ain't nothing more powerful than a changed mind, I tell you. There were, those were two characters who did not get forgiven for the sin that they had committed. But one gentleman in the Bible, and I know you know him very well, his name is David. He was forgiven. Now David was a murderer and an adulterer. He committed adultery, okay, with his eyes open. Okay, and he uh, committed what they call today first degree murder. First premeditated first degree murder. Okay, he had an innocent man killed because he wanted his wife. He got her pregnant, and in order to cover it up, he wanted, uh, can't remember the man's name, wanted him to go home and sleep with his wife. He wouldn't do it because he was loyal to his job and to his king. The king, the same king that had him killed. Okay, but how did David receive redemption? He repented. Nathan the prophet came along and started talking to uh, David about, uh, gave him some examples of what happened with a man doing wrong. And he said, well, surely that man should die. And Nathan said, well, you are that man. So now David went and repented. He touched the Ark of the Covenant and he was forgiven. But he continued to repent. He was a spiritual man. He didn't just go to God once and say, forgive me, Lord. He did it over and over again. He sung to the Lord. He danced before the Lord. That's why his wife didn't want it, because he was showing off and he was dancing before the Lord. And he was like, you show it off, you're a spectacle. You know, she didn't like all that. So that's why they didn't get along. He danced before the Lord, he sung before the Lord, he wrote poetry and everything. But don't, don't think that the man was weak just because he was writing poetry. He was mighty in battle. Okay, and he won every war, every fight that he fought. Okay, and that's the only kind of victory you can get when you fight for the Lord. So forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. It's definitely a prerequisite that we need to do. But we also need to forgive ourselves. We need to learn how to forgive ourselves. You know, I mean, don't go, we need to say, forgive me, Lord, for I know not what I do. But don't go say, forgive me, Lord, for I know not what I do. Bam! Before, just before you knock somebody in the head. <laughs> you know. <laughs> say, forgive me, Lord, for I know not what I do. And then just try to stay away from that sin. We know it's not easy. Because I can imagine Jesus, it was very hard for him to, you know, to make a decision to get up there and be nailed to a cross. Because I think his father, God, had asked him to do it for him. His father sent him so that he could be what they call a propitiation, a go-between. Okay, and this one man who they thought was a weakling, he talks soft, 
you know, and he, he didn't he carry a big stick, but he was meek and humble, and they thought that because he was that, that he was a weakling. But see, it ain't what it looked like. It's never what it looked like. And God can take a nobody and he can turn him into a somebody. He's already, we're already somebody, but God can make us, you know, we got to stop thinking small. We got to think big. Get our minds out the gutter. That's why we can't think big because our minds is in the gutter. But forgiveness is a powerful thing. If you can learn how to say, as Jesus said on the cross, forgive them, Lord, but they don't like what they do. On a, you have to say it on a regular basis. You know, you got to be like, forget the Lord, but they don't like what they do. You know. <laughs> you might have to go in the bathroom right then and there and be like, Lord. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, we have to just remember this, you know, to say those words. That starts it. That begins it. That lets God know and say, okay, now I release you now from the obligation of trying to, to get him back for what he did to you. You know, don't worry about it. Just go about your business. If they tell you what to, if your boss tells you what to do, in First Peter it talks about uh, do as your boss, they sell slaves back then, but do as your boss tells you to, to do, even if they are harsh and cruel. But do it anyway. But then be patient under the blows because God is pleased with you when you do that. See, we're being obedient to the word of God when we do these things. You know, God says if you're being obedient, it's better than sacrifice. We have to have love in our hearts. That's another commandment. You know, Jesus had to love us in order for him to die for us. Because I ain't going to die. I'm not dying for you. Yeah, I ain't going to hell for you or with you either. You know. But Jesus loved us so much that he died. He said his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When you see you're not going to perish, he's going to renew us. There was one chapter, one uh, scripture that I wanted to read. Like, like fire. It's in Job 33. Anybody got a, a, it's, I think it's Job 33. You have a Bible? Anyway, I'll, as you're getting that scripture, I'll tell you a little bit about what it, it says, what I remember of it. It talks about uh, forgiveness. 